everyone. And welcome to our webinar, Applying Instructional Design Principles to Create Meaningful Learning Experiences, featuring Litmos's Chief Learning Officer, Dr. Jill Stefaniak. Thanks so much for taking the time out of your day, everyone. And uh, while we allow more attendees to trickle in, I'll go ahead and give some housekeeping notes. Uh, this is a live webinar, but it will be recorded and made available to all registrants. So keep an eye on your inbox later today. And uh, make sure to pop into the chat widget there on your right to introduce yourself, tell us where you're from, uh, and network a little bit. Uh, if you do have questions throughout the presentation, there is a Q&A box uh, in that same area where you can type your questions at any time and members of our team will do our best to respond to those questions as they arise. Uh, but also we will be saving some time at the end of this presentation for a live Q&A where we'll highlight some of the questions that we'd like to answer live with Dr. Jill. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce today's presenter, Dr. Jill Stefaniak. Dr. Jill Stefaniak is Litmos's chief learning officer and her chief interests are professional development and L&D um, for instructional design decision making. And she also serves as the associate professor in learning and design and technology program at the University of Georgia. And just a reminder that this content represents the opinions of Dr. Jill and it carries no endorsement of the University of Georgia. So welcome Dr. Jill and take it away. Thank you, Liz. Um, and I realize that our time is is short uh, today as we're going through this webinar, but we do have a couple of topics that we'd like to be able to, to cover with everyone today. Um, our, we'd like to be able to identify key concepts in the instructional design process for those of you that are leading L&D initiatives um, in your organizations. We'll talk about the ways in which we can scale needs assessment strategies to meet your learners' needs um, and differentiate between different types of learning outcomes. And, and lastly, look at the ways in which we can ensure that there is alignment between all of our L&D efforts um, as it relates to our, our organizational goals, our L&D goals, and individual learning outcomes specific to different programs and initiatives. And so when we think about um, key instructional design concepts. I always like to start off any conversation that I have with folks about instructional design um, with this particular definition. Um, there's a lot of different definitions out there describing what is instructional design. And this is one that I tend to gravitate towards the most. Um, it says that instructional design is the science and art of creating detailed specifications for the development, evaluation, and maintenance of situations which facilitate learning and performance. And there's two th reasons why I like this definition so much. And so as you're thinking about the work that you're currently doing, I think you should, you should all be able to resonate with this. It recognizes that instructional design is both a science and an art. And so L&D professionals, we know that there are certain strategies that are going to help us when we're designing and delivering instruction. But we also know that everything is very unique and contextually situated. And that's where this artfulness comes in. This is where we have that opportunity to be able to, to get creative and modify our designs to meet the needs of our, of our learning audience and of that particular situation that we're designing for. And lastly, this definition explicitly acknowledges that all instructional designers are working towards facilitating learning and improving performance. And so if we were to look at what everyone's doing on this webinar today, if we looked at all of our different roles and our contributions to L&D, that's one thing we would all have in common is that regardless of what industry we're working in or the role that we're serving in L&D, we're all working towards facilitating learning and improving performance. And so those are things that we need to keep asking, um, reminding ourselves and asking ourselves ourselves as we're going through that instructional design process is are we in fact contributing to those to those overhanging goals um, when we look at um when we look at um uh, looking i'm sorry when we look at what l d professionals are responsible for um, this is where um, we're responsible for facilitating learning and improving performance we're looking at identifying opportunities to um to support um, to support employee and organizational goals and designing and facilitating instructional solutions that, that engage learners.
And then when we lastly, when we look at the, the typical ID process, um, a common process that's typically used in L&D is the ADI process. And this is where we engage in um, analyzing, designing, developing and implementing and evaluating instructional solutions. And so when we look at um, analyzing, this is where we're initially identifying what those needs are. So we're looking at what are those programmatic needs um, as we're developing instruction? What are the needs of our organization of that particular situation? And lastly, the needs of our, of our learning audience. Um, when we start shifting into design, this is where we're really starting to create those, those course design plans. We're starting to look at how is everything going to be um, coming together? Um, we then start moving into the, the development side of things. This is where we're starting to take that content that we've initially created and brainstormed in that design phase, and we're starting to, to shift those things. So if we're designing for e-learning experiences, this is where we're actually starting to develop and, and beta test those e-learning modules. Implement implementation is when we're moving forward um, and we're disseminating that information to our learning audience. And then, um, and then lastly, um, I'm sorry, Liz, are you able to see my, my camera? I, I'm not, but we can turn your camera on if you'd prefer. Yeah, it's on, on my end. So, um, uh, and then, um, okay, there we go. Yep, I've had it on. Sorry about that, everyone. Actually, when we move into evaluation, this is where we're looking at ways in which we can assess our learning. So this is where during the evaluation phase, we're assessing um, the, the learning outcomes related to that particular um, training module or training experience that we've created. Um, one of the things that I want to um, point out, though, when we look at this typical ID process and, and one of the challenges that we have is that um, analysis and evaluation serve as the bookends for the ADI process, which I think is really important. Um, but it's also important to recognize that instructional design is an iterative process. We're constantly going back and refining our designs over time as we're gathering more information, as we're, as we're obtaining feedback from subject matter experts and other key stakeholders within our organizations. So I, I want you just to be thinking about as you're thinking about your own L&D um, efforts and, and programming, um, we don't just do analysis in the beginning and then forget about it. It's something that we're constantly refining and, and adding more information to um, as we're um, as we're going through that that design um, that design experience. And so things that we should be thinking about and constantly just kind of um, keeping our eyes and ears open is looking at um, how can we um, make sure that what we're designing is, is truly meeting the needs of our learners. And then lastly, when we start thinking about evaluation, going beyond the knowledge checks that we may be um, um, integrating into those learning modules and thinking about ways in which that we can um, assess the overall experience. And so really looking at our is what we're designing, is what we're implementing and disseminating to our learners really achieving um, those initial training goals and those L&D goals within our organization. And so when we look at the overarching goals of instructional design, as we're going through that ADI process and we're designing um, and we're designing training solutions, we should be asking ourselves four things. Am I contributing to effectiveness? Am I contributing to efficiency? Am I contributing to ease of learning? And am I engaging my learners? And so if we think about these four E's, it's really important that we're thinking about how are the design decisions that we're making addressing these four questions? Um, so we wanna make sure that what we're designing is intuitive to our learners, that they're seeing value in what's being presented to them, that they're engaged, that they're motivated to take content that they're learning and be able to apply that and transfer that into their regular responsibilities within their organization organization and learning setting. And so this kind of goes into to scaling needs assessment. Um, and I know that um, we have a poll. Liz, would you like to introduce that poll um, to everybody? And so one of the challenges that we have with needs assessment is that it varies um, the, in, in terms of how often or how frequent or how frequent our organizations um, have the opportunity to engage in, in needs assessment. So we're just kind of curious to see what everyone in this webinar has to say about that. Getting some live results here. <laughs> <laughs> Very exciting.
Well, that's wonderful. I'm very excited to see that 24% today um, noted that they do them frequently. I'd like to know where you work so I so I can visit. Um, I, I am a huge advocate for, for needs assessment within the workplace because so much information that can be gathered during that needs assessment um, can really help drive our, our design decisions and programming decisions for the future. But I also know that it also comes with there's a lot of challenges in being able to do that. Um, sometimes it's finding the time to be able to gather sufficient data for all of our individual um, instructional programs that we may be developing. If you're working as consultants, you know, sometimes it's real, it's, it can be difficult to have those conversations with clients, trying to convince them to, to allocate some additional time and resources to that needs assessment phase. And so one of the things that I think is really important for L&D professionals to consider are what are the different ways in which we can scale this? And so when we think about just the value that needs assessment brings to the L&D process, it helps us address recurring um, performance problems within our organization. It helps identify strategies to improve the quality of existing organizational practices and initiatives. And it helps in identifying opportunities for growth and expansion. So if we were to look at today, all of the L&D projects we, everybody in this webinar may be working on, we would probably be able to start classifying those projects in terms of, are they addressing a problem within our organization? Um, are they addressing um, quality improvement where something's working well right now, but we have that opportunity to just kind of refine what we're doing and improve that overall experience. And then lastly, looking at, do we are we working on those brand new projects programs, brand new product lines, brand new training initiatives that are really going to help our organization grow and expand. And so when we look at the needs assessment process, being able to gather data to really understand the unique nuances pertaining to um, that particular organization or context can be really helpful for us when we start planning out that, that going through that ADDIE process and not just focusing in on the design, but really thinking about the timing of our implementation, the timing of how we're going to assess those outcomes. All of that information can be gathered during that needs assessment phase. But when we think about uh, if we don't have that opportunity to be able to engage in a full scale needs assessment where we can really dedicate some time and resources to it, um, one way that we can do this, is we can still scale those needs assessment efforts. And so as L&D professionals, there are ways that we can we can gather that information when we're having conversations with our subject matter experts, when we're engaged in conversations with our um, clients and other key stakeholders within our organization that will help us um, as we're refining our design throughout that training process. And so things that we can do is we, we can design content thinking about ways in which we can design content that meets the needs of our learners where they're at when they need it. We talk a lot in L&D about wanting to engage our, our learners and learners are most engaged when they see the utility, relevance, and value of the content that's being presented to them. Um, if, I'm sure if we did a show of hands and said, how many times were you were we ever required to go through mandatory training for work um, that you end up going back to your desk and saying, I don't even have these tools. I don't have this software. I'm never going to be able to to use any of this information that can be really frustrating. And so if we think about our, our learning audience. We want to be able to help them see the relevance. We want them to be able to, to leave those training experiences after they've acquired that new information. We want them to feel engaged and motivated and, and feeling confident that they're going to be able to apply those new skills to their um, current, um, within their respective roles within that organization. And so things that we can be um, looking at doing is focusing in on asking four key questions that can help us scale those needs assessment efforts. So one of the things I want you to be thinking about is um, if you go into our um, resources section, you'll see that we have a handout that a customizable handout so you can kind of make notes on all of these things. If you don't have the opportunity to be able to engage in a, a, a large scale needs assessment for any of your projects, these are four questions that you could ask, whether it was during a kickoff meeting with your clients, if it's a kickoff meeting with your um, design team, really just to make sure that everyone has a good understanding of what the needs are related to that particular project. So asking questions such as, what are learners' perceptions of utility regarding training? 
how how often is are your learners going through training? Do they see the value in it? Are they burnt out because they've just been overwhelmed with um, a lot of different training requirements within your organization? Part one of the things that we want to be thinking about as we go through that instructional design process, particularly with um, implementation, is how can we how can we support them? How do we have to time some of those instructional activities or instructional experiences? We also want to think about what do our learners value? What are they hoping to achieve from, from the trainings that they're participating in? How can we help them in terms of upskilling, in terms of career development um, as they're going through and experiencing a variety of different learning modules or learning experiences? We also want to look at how relevant is your learner's um, training to their daily job responsibilities. So if we know that we're designing things such as just-in-time training where they're going to be accessing content while they're completing tasks, we want them to see the relevance in that. We want them to, to view that as being useful and being helpful. So making sure that things are up to date, that we're current with current organizational policies and procedures and, and software applications is really important. And then lastly, thinking about about what mechanisms are in place to support learners after training. And so things that we can be thinking about is what happens when the learner completes that instructional or training experience, and then they go back to their job. What happens if they still require additional assistance? And so these are things where we can start thinking about just-in-time learning resources. Do we have infographics? Do we have job aids that can guide them? Do they have a community where they can pose questions and seek help once training's completed and now they're trying to figure out a way that they can um, meaningfully engage, meaningfully engage in, in transfer of that newly acquired knowledge. Um, this last question is also really important because we can also start thinking about what are some of those non-instructional interventions that will be helpful in supporting our learners. As L&D professionals, usually our, our, our priority or our primary focus is on designing and developing instructional content. But it's also really important to be thinking about, do we have adequate infrastructure in place to support those learners and to support those designs? Um, I've, I've worked for some companies over the years, and you could have the best piece of instruction. Um, you could design the best piece of instruction. But if you don't have adequate infrastructure to support its implementation and to support the learners afterwards, that instruction is going to be dead on arrival. And so it's really important that you're engaging in those conversations, thinking about how are your learners going to be supported um, throughout that process. And so this kind of leads into as we're gathering the information regarding, you know, from that needs assessment or scaling those needs assessment questions. Another important component of this instructional design process that we should be thinking about throughout the entire phase of our design development and implementation are the ways in which we can differentiate learning outcomes. And so one of the things that's really important here is keeping the end in mind. So thinking about what types of knowledge do we want to elicit from our learners' performance? And so this is where we really have to start thinking. If you think about curricular mapping, um, if you have a series of instructional modules that you'd like for your learners to, to engage with, thinking about what is it that we want them to be able to do at the end? Are we designing something to elicit procedural knowledge, conceptual knowledge, or conditional knowledge. So depending on what it is that you're designing for, if you're designing for um, novices or, or experts or more advanced content, when we think about procedural knowledge, those are those step-by-step, -step, um, that's step-by-step -step guidance on how to complete a particular task. When we look at conceptual knowledge, this is where we're looking at those facts and theories and just fundamental concepts that are going to be driving performance. And then lastly, this is where we have conditional knowledge. This is where we want to start thinking about ways in which we can support our learners in their problem solving. And so um, as L&D professionals, we could talk through what an ideal instructional design process or experience should look like. But oftentimes, I'm, I'm, I, I would feel very comfortable saying everyone on this call is probably really um, comfortable um, and has been required to juggle multiple plates in the air simultaneously. You may be juggling multiple programs, you may, you know, trying to track down your subject matter expert or really making sure on how much time do you have to refine some of those designs, um, thinking about ways in which we can support our learners being able to be proactive problem solvers um, when they go back and they transfer that, um, th that newly acquired knowledge into their, into their workplace settings. And so things that we want to be thinking about is 
depending on what our goals are for the learning experience that we're designing, whether it's pr procedural, conceptual, conditional knowledge, or a combination of the three, things that we want to be thinking about is how does that align with the learning objectives that we're creating? Um, and one of the challenges that I've seen over and over again in L&D is that we create learning objectives, usually at the beginning, and then we start designing content. And as more and more people provide feedback on that content, we, we start to engage in a little bit of scope creep. And sometimes we shift or we stray away from those learning objectives. And we don't always go back to look at, is there direct alignment between the content that we're now um, uh, implementing within those learning experiences? Other challenges that we typically see too is that what types of assessments or knowledge checks are we integrating into those learning experiences? And are they direct reflections of those learning objectives that we've created at the beginning of training? And so I would really implore everyone um, on this call today, um, when you start designing your content and you're looking at those learning objectives, um, pay a little closer attention to the learning objectives before you before you implement and disseminate that content to your learners. Look to see to what extent do you have that alignment because sco scope creep is almost inevitable and it's always going to happen. And so this is where we can look at what types of adjustments do we need to make in terms of um, just maybe it's refining a couple of those verbs and those learning objectives and then looking at what types of assessments do we have in place. Other things that are really important here is looking at what scaffolding is needed to support learning transfer. And so when we think about our learners, um, when, when they're engaged in training, that instructional context is really important. But the other context that I think is the most important piece that sometimes gets neglected is how, how successful, how confident do, do our learners feel in being able to transfer that learning um, into their workplace settings. And so we, I encourage everyone in the chat, um, what types of, I'll, we'll give everyone a minute just to be able to type in some of your responses here, um, but what types of scaffolding are you putting in place to ensure that your learners are successfully able to transfer what they're learning and trainings um, to, their, to their current jobs? Don't be shy, everyone. <laughs> oh, I'm yeah, seeing job aids. Job aids yeah. Thank you, Tammy. Application guides. Oh, I love that. Buddies and mentors. That's very important. So, so when we think about scaffolding, think about if we were de developing training, what types of guardrails do we need to put up to support our learners so that they feel confident that they have sufficient resources in place to be able to implement change um, within their respective roles. So if they're going through training and they're learning how to complete a new, um, a new task or they're learning, um, they're acquiring additional knowledge, um, what do we have in place to support them when training's complete? They go back to their, their desks, so to speak, and we're expecting them to be able to implement what they've just learned. Yeah, I see a lot of one page help sheets. There was one that it was really interesting. Give them test environments to replicate the actions they've mm -hmm. learned, especially procedural trainings. A absolutely. Simulations can be really helpful for that. Um, for, for anyone on this call who's ever taken an introductory instructional design course, um, going through a task analysis where you're breaking down how to complete a task step by step by step, um, this can be really helpful for those, those job aids and those infographics that we might design. Um, I love seeing opportunities for practice. Because again, when we're looking at being able to engage in meaningful transfer, um, that takes time. It takes time to, to ensure that there's been a permanent change in, in learning and behavior. And so providing them with opportunities um, to receive feedback or coaching where necessary, to be able to practice those skills and become more confident with them, that's really important in facilitating that transfer process. So thank you, everyone. Other things that we want to be thinking about is our, when we're designing instruction, our learning objectives should be driving the instructional activities that we integrate into training. And so things that we should be thinking about um, as we're going through that instructional process is looking at um, what types of verbs are being used? We don't we don't always pay close attention to, to that. And so looking at is there direct alignment between the, the verbs that we're using in those learning objectives and what types of assessments do we have? So if you think about some of the, the content that you may have uh, most recently developed, if we're developing e-learning modules and a lot of the 
the knowledge checks or assessments at the end um, are, are recall questions. And that's where we might want to start looking at that Bloom's taxonomy and those lower level learning objectives, because those are typically the verbs that are going to elicit recall performance. Um, if our goal is for our learners to be able to engage in application and be able to demonstrate those new skills um, to, in order to receive feedback, then that's where we want to make sure that there is alignment in those verbs. And so whatever it is that we're expecting our learners to do or whatever we're aiming for them to be able to do at the end, we want to make sure that we see direct alignment in that. So that when the time comes and we engage in evaluation of, of all of our training programs, we can then look and say, yes, we have evidence showing that our learners um, are, are very proficient in achieving those learning objectives that we're, that we're setting forward and we're setting forth with um, in our training programs. And so as we're starting to look at ways in which we can align instruction with our learning outcomes, there's three key things that we can be looking at doing. We can look at um, ensuring alignment between instructional content, activities, assessments, and evaluative outcomes. Um, as L&D professionals, I think we do a really good job of being um, careful during that design phase and, and, and mapping out and creating plans for that instructional design. But I would really encourage everyone when the time comes be before you click, you know, publish um, with that final product that you're going to share with your learning audience, going back to that design plan to see, are there any updates that are needed? Do we have direct alignment? If a goal is for our learners to be able to demonstrate something, um, to demonstrate performance. And we want to make sure that we're incorporating instructional activities where they're able to do that. So as we were looking in the chat, seeing things such as role playing, simulations, opportunities for them to, to practice those skills in that instructional context can be really helpful. If we're looking at, um, if, the, if the goal is um, recalling and differentiating between different concepts or, or, or different strategies that are being used within our organizations, then it's really important then that the, that the content, the instructional activities they're engaged in reflect that, but also that the assessments reflect that too. We also want to make sure that our assessments should be designed to measure learners' knowledge and retention of topics. And so, again, it's really important. This can become problematic when we're bringing in a lot of different people onto that design team. It's really important that everyone understands what those learning objectives are, what are the assessment goals um, within our organization, so that we do have that alignment. Sometimes this can get um, lost a little bit, or we can engage in some design scope creep when we have when we have larger design teams. So this is something I think is really important just to remind everyone of when you're engaged in, in those design activities up front. And then lastly, we want to make sure that the instructional content and assessment should be relevant to the desired level of performance. And so this is really important when we're thinking about what are those prerequisite skills? Are we, are we developing learning modules for novices? Um, are we developing something for um, employees that may be a little bit more advanced? Are we developing um, content for, for managers or supervisors? It's really important that we think about who our learning audience is, and, and we kind of center that learner as being the center of everything that we do. Um, and it's really important that we kind of start asking ourselves, how will, will a beginner be able to answer these questions? How confident will a learner be in being able to, a uh, beginning learner be, how confident will they be in demonstrating and applying some of that new knowledge. Um, those are things that we want to be thinking about so that, again, if we go back to scaling our needs assessment questions, this also will help contribute to um, improving our learners' perceptions of utility. We want them to see the relevance in this. If we're designing content for advanced learners, we want them to, to recognize that they are um, refining their expertise. Where we want to recognize um, all the information and the expertise that they're bringing to that learning experience and trying to find ways and identify ways for them to be able to build upon um, those skill sets. When we look at ways that we can kind of tie all of this together as we're trying to maximize workplace learning and performance, it's really important that we're ensuring fit between the learner and the content. This is where L&D professionals, um, sometimes we're responsible for being on the admin side and assigning the content. Sometimes we're working with our, our clients on that or providing recommendations. So these are areas where I think it's really important to be engaged in those conversations to make sure that we, we are presenting our learners with content that is useful to them and that meets them where they're at when they need it. 
Um, we Again, we want to make sure that we're aligning instructional activities with evaluative outcomes, not just for assessing those individual instructional experiences, but if we were to take that 30,000 foot view of everything that our organization's doing right now, if we took a 30,000 foot view of our L&D efforts, really looking at how are we achieving those, those outcomes? To what extent are we achieving those outcomes and what needs to be changed? And so if we can look at the instructional activities that we have in place, we can then start looking at to what degree do we have alignment between those activities and where is there opportunity for some more? Um, lastly, looking at ways in which we can achieve instructional congruence by empowering our learners. And so this is where we're going to look at ways in which L&D can be viewed as being central to, to workplace performance, not just separated as L&D efforts or trainings that learners have to go through, but having them think of L&D as just being a regular part of their job. So this is where we start looking at um, how are we communicating to our employees or to our learners that learning is valued, that we're, that that we value ups, uh, upskilling, that we value um, their abilities to, to grow in career development within our organizations. And so this is where we're starting to look at ways in which we can um, you know, weave in L&D into other aspects and other functions of our organizations. And by having those types of conversations with leaders and key stakeholders, this is where we're going to see overall alignment and success for our learners um, in that transfer setting. And so we'd like to take some time to make sure we've got an opportunity to answer any questions from, from the audience. I'm popping back on so I can <laughs> uh, help facilitate the Q&A section. Thanks everyone for all the awesome questions we're getting. You're keeping us busy here. Um, and I wanted to start off with um, a question from Christy Hall um, regarding the value utility relevance matrix that you explained earlier when it comes to needs assessments. Um, Christy wondered, what is meant by utility? Utility, when we look at um, context um, in instructional design, it's really looking at um, the usefulness of it. Do you see an opportunity for you to be able to use that content and apply that content? Um, I, I can give you an example of this. Um, I remember working for a company and we had to go through software training and it was the latest and greatest version of the software application. And so we had to sit through hours of training. And then we all went back to work and realized that we were like two versions behind on what was pr presented in that training. And our organization had no plans on updating that software. And there was enough changes where it was very difficult to navigate it. So that would be an example where you sit there and go, I've just wasted so much time in training and I'm not gonna be able to use it. Um, and so if you have learners that are already kind of going in with pre pre preconceived notions um, about training within your organization, you want them to be able to go into that instructional experience or that training experience and say, this information is going to be useful to me and I'm going to be able to apply it. Um, and so that's how we can start looking at what then absolutely needs to be covered in that instructional content to meet them where they're at. Right. Yeah. yeah that makes sense. Um, another question we have from Anne-Marie Lake. Can you please explain the differences between conceptual knowledge and conditional knowledge? Yeah, absolutely. So if we look at conceptual knowledge, those would be those basic concepts and facts um, related to a particular topic. So, so since we have a lot of L&D professionals on this call, I'll, I'll use an L&D example. If we were going through um, the, um, the instructional design process. I know we, we covered it very briefly in today's webinar. Um, we could go through the, the various steps of instructional design and we could kind of treat that in a very systematic and linear process going step by step. You know, first you do this and then you do this and, and this is what's considered good design. But then if we look at, and that would be considered examples of conceptual knowledge. If we look at learning theories and, and thinking about ways in which our learners um, um, retrieve information and process information, um, those are all examples of conceptual knowledge. When we start moving into conditional knowledge, this is 
what happens in the real world? What happens when we're engaged in designing instruction for different clients and they have very unique needs? Or what happens when we're engaged with clients with very um, different personalities? We've all we've all designed content for, for easy clients and some more difficult and de more demanding clients. And so that's where as, as L&D professionals, we're having to flex a lot and adapt our processes to meet the needs of our clients, our stakeholders, and, and those projects. And so being able to, to train our learners on, on what strategies do you need to employ to be able to navigate some of those conversations and contexts would be examples of conditional um, knowledge. So if you think about anything that it is that you're designing right now, if, if you think about what it is that you want your learners to be able to do, what types of problem solving do you want them to do? What are some of those constant challenges that they may be faced with? Because if you can integrate some of those as examples within your trainings, you're going to help support their conditional knowledge along the way as well. Wow. Yeah. Um, I think, okay, I'm seeing another one from Carolyn Wiley. Um, this is an interesting one. W would you consider a DEA or sorry, a DEI or a DBNI climate survey a needs assessment? I, I definitely I, I definitely think it would be a part of one. Um, so depending on what that survey looks like, um, and I'll try not to get on my soapbox with needs assessment. Um, oftentimes, if we were if we were engaged in a in a large scale needs assessment, you'd want to gather data um, from multiple stakeholders within your organization in multiple forms. So it could be things such as um, a climate survey. Absolutely, it could be those um, having conversations with with management and various levels within the organization, um, different departments to see um, um, how how are things being perceived within an organization? Um, the larger our organizations are, the more siloed they tend to be. So making sure that you're getting representation from a variety of different um, organizational functions would be important. But I definitely think that, um, um, especially those um, open-ended questions that can be included on climate surveys can be very telling and can really help inform some of those training initiatives um, that you might want to include as you're moving forward. Um, to that end, I, can you go into a little detail about how you would analyze sort of open-ended questions to to come up with insights? Absolutely. So some of the things that I would recommend doing is, um, you know, the, the quantitative data is really important, um, but it's oftentimes, you know, if someone's um, rating something as, you know, one out of five or two out of five, we, we don't always know what are those differences. And especially when we don't know, especially when these are anonymous surveys, we don't necessarily know what experiences are they drawing from to inform those ratings. Um, but that can also kind of help you too, where you can see and get an overall picture of, of how is everyone in certain departments or within our organization rating things. Um, but the qualitative data, I think, can be really helpful um, providing those open-ended questions where sometimes your um, your response, um, th those that are um, filling out those surveys, they may give examples on those things. I'd recommend um, coding them, not having to go into, um, you know, full-blown qu um, qualitative analysis that you might do for a research project, but what are some of those key themes that you're seeing in some of those responses? And then you could, you could count up what some of those different themes are. So if you're, if you're hearing similar concerns on multiple occasions throughout that survey, that would be a good indicator. That's something that management and leadership might want to take a look at um, as you're moving forward with, with different initiatives to improve your, your DEI efforts. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and to that end, we have a similar question that maybe you covered a little bit in your last response, but Jen wants to know, what types of data should we gather? It's a little more of a general question. So I, I will I will give the typical um, instructional design answer, which is it all depends. Um, but I think that um, gathering data from a variety of sources. So I would if you have an opportunity to engage in conversations, um, just having conversations, interviewing folks or having informal um, interviews with different members of your organization can be really helpful. Um, climate surveys, feedback surveys are, are really helpful as well. Um, if you have that opportunity to look at direct observations, um, if you're involved in developing new content for, for learners and, and you have access to that learning audience, if you're an in-house L&D professional, I think sometimes being able to, to walk the floors and see what they're experiencing, that can be really helpful for you as you're designing that content and really understanding what are some of the challenges that they may be experiencing completing certain tasks and in certain um, functions within the organization. 
Um, I also think um, looking at um, analytics, looking at the information that we have available to us when our learners are going through training, looking at what, what is the completion rate? Where are they struggling with certain aspects? How does this tie into career development and performance reviews? These are all um, areas where we can really, really rich areas where we can gather information to help inform us on what we need to be doing for moving forward with training. Great. Um, and I think we we have a little time left, so I'm going to try to pop a couple more questions your way. We have one from Stephanie asking, how do you guide clients in identifying the best learning formats for learning content, i.e. e-learning, classroom, et cetera? I think it comes down to what makes the most sense for their learning audience. And so there's... Um, there are times where it could be on the job training, depending on how many learners are, are cycling through um, requiring training at, at one point in time. So if you think about onboarding, there's times where compliance training, um, it can be really helpful to have that in an online format because you probably have so many employees within your organization requiring that and getting hired at different times. Um, there's also an opportunity though that if, if there's a lot of job shadowing going on, that's where that um, face to face training can be really helpful as well, um, where there, there, it's more of that one-to-one -one ratio. I think ultimately it depends on um, where your learners situated. If you have learners that are scattered um, all over the world or all over the country in different regions and you want them coming together, um, instructor-led training can be very expensive. And so it depends on what the purpose is for bringing everyone together. And, and sometimes there's an organizational need for that, um, but that's ultimately up to the client to start thinking about. If, if they're looking at developing training that they don't anticipate is going to be changing too much in the near future, online instruction can be really helpful for that. And so that you can be designing these e-learning modules that can be accessed at any point in time um, over and over again by multiple learners. So I think it's really having those conversations with your clients about what are what are their goals, what are their organizational goals, what what is the what is the purpose of of wanting to do um, training in the first place, and then you can kind of start um, prompting them to start thinking about what's the longevity of the training that you're going to be developing and implementing. Right, and and to your point about making content um, for many people across the globe and distributed teams, um, related to that, we uh, I'm going to say this is probably the last question we'll be able to address live uh, before we wrap up. But Anne Marie Lake asked, uh, "I'm designing content that will be used for learners from multiple organizations at the same time. It'll be hard to get evaluation over time from these organizations of the training's effectiveness. Any ideas for how to build this kind of scenario?" It's difficult. Um, I've seen some companies working with your sales team. So if your sales, if your sales team's reaching out and, and doing um, follow up calls with your clients, asking how things are going, asking them if they can share information. Not all of your clients will, but that's a good way of looking at getting some feedback. Or, um, you know, if we think about how we scale um, the needs assessment, if, if, if you were only able to ask, you know, those four questions we talked about earlier today, um, when, you know, in the middle of a kickoff call with a client or with your design team, if you were thinking about um, what what are those you know two or three questions you'd want to know of every client so that if sales were following up with them maybe they could ask and get some feedback on what was most useful about these trainings what recommendations do you have for us to to improve or refine this over time then that could kind of help um, provide you with some um, ideas for how you might refine some of those courses especially if you're designing off-the-shelf courses where you might not have direct access to that learning audience Great. Well, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Jill. And thanks to everyone who made the time to join us today and ask such amazing questions and, and interact in the chat. Just a reminder that uh, if you, uh, when you registered for this, uh, we'll be sending you the recording of this webinar to the email that you registered with. And you can download the slides in that uh, resources section of your console. Again, thanks so much to everyone who was able to join us today. and. Have a great rest of your day.